the, report. the report to the trade magazines to try to elevate the to numbers, the the which they shots. do with every record at the time, but they unhappily they just happened to get caught doing it on yeah, our we record. Did. We, didn't we didn't know, it, you know. Yeah, we just went there, and then all of a sudden we were bad. Yeah, they hated yeah. us before we even got there. In England. I think that was mostly because I think our management really didn't book us in Europe because we were too busy in the United States. Do you remember? You know, I don't think we ever, you know, decided we didn't want to go to Europe. Yeah, we, we always just said, ah, we never have time because we did manage to get to Japan and, you know, places. We would like to. Have other places, them. but we just no, never. We went back for promotional purposes, but not to play a concert. Remember when we did Yeah, that? and they didn't like that. And I remember you had a whole book of lyrics stolen outside Dingwalls and went to a club one night um, to see a band mm -hmm. and out of the back of a limo or whatever, th you had a lyric book stolen. My bag was stolen. Your whole, oh, was your whole bag? Yeah. Shoulder bag. There was a thousand songs in there and they're all gone. <laughs> 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 no, actually, I, I don't Didn't even remember recover? what lyrics were in there, but... Did they recover something? I think they got the bag, but... No, oh, but nothing else. Somebody stupidly kept the lyrics. And they also put it in Melody Maker and stuff and then made fun of it. Do you, I won't even mention, remember what they said about the, about it? They said something like, who would want to steal these lyrics from this band or something like that? Paul they, Weller reviewed our single. From, they didn't from like the, us. He was in the jam at the time and he said you can melt it and make an ashtray out of it. That was they, his review. They Miller. accused us of being like a stadium <laughs> band or something. <laughs> they were real suspicious of yeah. us. Yeah. And we <laughs> they didn't like the American New Wave band coming there and upsetting the yeah, Sex nervous. Pistols. We played like a, a student 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 <clears throat> union at like Oxford University or somewhere and these little kids were like giving us the finger and like, you know, like we weren't cool enough for them or something and it was just weird. David wasn't usually green when we played. Yeah. Or not that green. Yeah, David was pretty sick. Because actually he was, he was laying on the table before we went out to and played the gig. We were just yeah, wondering. I was passed out in, the, gurney, in the car. Huh? They put you on a gurney, didn't they? they do, yeah, there was a cot. They, they put me in a car and drove me to, to uh, where the music lab thing was and then woke me up and said, okay, it's time to go on. And I was like, okay, okay. And I like, went out there and I played the show in a complete daze and then went back to this cot. And then they woke me up and put me in the car and took me away. And I didn't remember anything about being there at all. Except that I was blue. Green. Same thing with me. First time we went to England to make the record, oh, yeah. I got real sick. It's like food like poisoning. Food poisoning and dysentery or something. Yeah, I think when we started the tour, we were doing bars and things. And then at the end of the tour, we were probably almost headlining. Or were we headlining? Some and some opening. Yeah. Yeah, the, the tour was just nine, yeah, month, was nine months or ten months. It was long. Yeah. yeah. You know, the tour got bigger and the, the gigs got bigger. We kept asking our manager if we made it yet, but we never got an answer. So I don't know if we have yet. Yeah, I don't think we have. Because we never we heard. So We're not sure if we made it. We were just touring a lot, you know, after that first album. And it was kind of, you know, uh, you know, the, the record like actually took off kind of slow, cause, uh, which was kind of nice. But it was added, you know, if, if, uh, radio stations like sporadically. Uh, it wasn't like everybody played the single, like, and then it was mayhem. It was kind of like uh, Texas played the single, and then a couple months later, Chicago jumped on it. And then, so in the the first part of it, it was kind of like took about a year. And I think the more you know, the it got popular, like the touring, you know, like uh, people were saying we were opening for people, and then it sort of started to change, and then then people were opening for us. You know, we just kind of like, I think we decided then we were also going to try to have like, uh, you know, local bands open for us. Of course, you know, it would depend on, you know, most artists would be having an album that they were promoting. So, you know, there'd be a certain bunch of groups that were available to do a tour, but we'd have a pick of, among them. And in some states, we would just use the, the bands from the city if we could find out who they were. Yeah. Who were some of the people that you had? As opening acts? Yeah. Uh, Nick Lowe and Paul Carrick. The Motels. Bram Tchaikowski. Wang Chung. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Gilda. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> Nick right. Gilda. And also, on sections of tours, somebody would come for like five gigs or something. XTC yeah, opened right. XTC for us. for a couple of weeks or... Mm -hmm. 
and suicide on a couple of different occasions. Yes, yeah, suicide. Yeah, they, there was that week at the Paradise. And four nights at the Universal Amphitheater. Oh, That's yeah. the one I'll never forget, man. No, that was cool. They, he was, they were throwing stuff, and he's going, ah, oh, you suck just like your Dodgers. And, and they were just getting even madder and throwing ashtrays and full, full cups of beer at him and lit cigarettes. So wasn't that the gig where they came off stage saying, yeah, we killed them, we did great. Because <laughs> they had played longer than they had ever played with us at that gig. That was the thing. They played they for 20 they minutes, I think. more of their set than they ever yeah. had to play. They said, we, the audience loves us. We have them we in the palm of our hand. Craig, do you remember when they played the Paradise? We, you and me would climb up every night up into the, 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 the rafters and watch this show and watch the whole audience because it was always a spectacle. Like, you know, you didn't know what was going to happen if the guy, guy was going to get beat up or you Who's know, got how that? long was going to... Speaking of footage you didn't and stuff, miss do you have it? that footage of of suicide playing in complete darkness except for like a spot on Alan's face and all of a sudden drinks come into the light <laughs> and fists and bottles and stuff come in and he bounce off his face. Yeah, and he's got the big red mark on his face from smacking oh, himself with right, the mic. Right. So, so let's go back in the history. You most, you've all been in different bands before this. I mean, Modern Lovers, Milkwood, Martin Mull, then you'd been on TV. I mean, did this all like give you ideas about what you did and didn't want to do on stage by the time you got to the cars? I suppose so, because everything before before uh, it was all a learning experience. So you know, you get your act together and over the years, and yeah, we pretty much knew what we were going to be. We had discussions from time to time. Yeah. Plus, a lot of us were in bands before, uh, in the same band before the Cars, really. Because uh, that's right. Well, I was in Richard and the Rabbits with Rick and Ben. <laughs> Like two, the year before Captain Swain. That's when I heard you guys was Richard and the Rabbits. Oh, Richard and the Rabbits, yeah. yeah. Three had that. That's Boy, we had some brilliant, great, brilliant great. names great. for bands. Richard and the Rabbits was before Okasik and Orr. I remember that. A couple of the gigs. Yeah. That record company. That was Okasik and Orr at the Idler and stuff was after Richard and the Rabbits, though, I thought. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it, it was, was probably after. before and after. Well, I know that I went with a friend who was answered an ad in the Boston Phoenix to be a sound man and it was a press party at a roller skating rink the Ballaroo roller rink was that the name of it Don was the guy the name of it Don Liberty no 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 no, no, no. yeah and um, and and I just remember being struck by the fact that they were playing like p songs you know in the local bands at that time there were a lot of boogie bands and a lot of just sort of you know just riff rock stuff and what struck me and what what really impressed me was that they were playing pop songs and stuff and and I, I distinctly remember like having an opinion on it and like watching the guitar playing going you know he's okay but you know <laughs> I wouldn't mind being part of this you know I, I, and I actually had that thought and um, and after that the band broke up and I think Greg went and played with Martin Mull for a while an orphan right oh yeah and uh, and I started sitting in with Rick and Ben, they were just playing uh, with an acoustic guitar and a bass and singing some of Rick's songs and some cover songs and, and an Ace How Long and a couple other things, right? And uh, I just started bringing my guitar down and that developed into Captain Swing, mm -hmm. right? And which evolved into the cars yeah. to make a short story long. Yeah. Also, Rick and Ben were playing a place called the Speakeasy in Central Square when I was in the Modern Lovers. You mentioned it, but then I found like a program of nights that we played, and you guys played like Wednesdays or something, right? Oh yeah, we used to play alternative nights. So basically, it was just the Boston scene and people meeting each other and checking each other out, and you know, you get a couple of guys from one band, a couple from another, and, you know, you think you know, you look for the combination that you think is going to work best. And, that's how we evolved. I think we were all in our own world. I don't even think we paid attention. I mean, we knew that there was a lot of bands playing at the Rat, so we thought, oh yeah, it'd be a good place to play because they take new bands. But and maybe some stood out. You know, I always like when I first came to Boston in '72. I saw uh, the Modern Lovers. It was the first band I ever saw, and I saw them on the Common. You did? Yeah, <laughs> and that was the second day I was in town. Oh. And I lived in, Cam or in Somerville, so I walked to the Common, and you guys were playing, and I thought, wow, this city's great. <laughs> look, <laughs> at the, look at this stuff that's going on in the Common. Yeah. Then it didn't but, really uh, pick up until later, a few yeah. years later. But anyway, you know, basically, I don't think we 
No, we really didn't pay attention to much of that. But it was a, a good climate because the, the audiences were really receptive to all the different kinds of bands that were playing, and the bands were all friends. So it, that, that really helped us, too. In a sense, we played our first gig on New Year's Eve, right? Okay. So that was, and we made our record in the winter. So, it t you know, we played for that whole year and got signed somewhere along the line. And by, just right, didn't we just come home just before Christmas for making the record at air? So it was, no, it was February. Yeah, it was February. Okay, so it was just it was. after. The yeah, making the first record was February of '78. There you go. Oh yeah. So just about a year. Came out in June of '78. During the blizzard of '78. We played Harvard. Mix That's right. We, we were there during the blizzard. So you did before the record. You had airplay in Boston just from demo tapes with a lot of the same songs that were hits, which probably was even harder to do then than it is now. So how did that come about? Well, we had a, an ally and a friend at. Uh, BCN, you know, that Maxanne was a DJ there, and she was like one of those uh, people who like to go out and see bands, you know, which is uh, something radio stations probably should be doing, but don't ever do it anymore. And she actually scouted around, and she kind of just liked the band. She liked a, a, a prior version of it. She even liked Captain Swing. Yes. You know, she was playing demos from Captain Swing, too. Uh, she saw us at the, the Newberry Street Fair, yeah. or one of those street fairs. So. You know, it was actually her who kind of picked, uh, like, what song to play on the radio, and she played it on her show. I mean, she picked just what I needed to play, I guess, Yeah. on yeah, her own. Yeah. She had a couple of songs. I think she had You're All I Got Tonight, too. That was the and, other one, yeah. And maybe mm. all mixed up or something. She had us in, like, heavy rotation. But she did play. She played that all the time. And then the other DJ started playing it as well, <coughs> you know, just what I needed. And then that's obviously when the record companies came. It was getting reported in the tip yeah, sheets. Yeah, that's what it, what it was. It got reported on all the tip sheets as tape. And hardly any stations anywhere in the country had anything on a tape on their, on their playlist. You know, like a Gavin Report or Friday Morning Quarterback, and there'd be a column, what label, you know, playing, you know, Aerosmith, Columbia, Elton John, MCA, whatever it was, and saying, Cars, tape. <laughs> you know? We had a lot of, we played a lot of songs, so. <clears throat> we probably had, I don't even know how many we have, but we must have had 20 or 30 songs. And, you know, because we, we had to fill up. Sometimes we had to play, you know, more than one set in a club. So we yeah. just had to have a lot of songs. And uh, we just had all kinds of them. But, I mean, you know, there were songs that the audience responded to more than others. And that might have been one of them, you know, for sure. But I certainly don't think anybody... I don't know. I, I, that's, I remember hearing that one, because I was like the last one to join the band. And I remember hearing just what I needed, thinking, first time I heard it, thinking, wow, that's like, that's pretty cool. It's like, it's got something sort of unique about it, and it's like it's nice and concise and, you know, sh you know, fairly short pop song format, right to the, so I, re I still remember hearing that one for the first time. I think it was pretty casual, you know, between Ben and I, because we had been playing together for like, uh, you know, forever. I mean, you know, since we were like 18, you know, so like, uh, and we played lots of things together, you know, from Cleveland, Detroit, all these cities, and we just like, when we played songs, we just went, how oh, you sing this, I'll sing that. Oh, you sing this. It wasn't any big deal, you know. Al although I did keep in mind that if it needed to have a good voice, it should be Ben. I definitely thought, well, this is maybe this is a song that has a lot of melody and it needs a good voice, so Ben should sing this one. <laughs> We'd talk about it for about a minute or two and decide it be suitable. Sometimes a rehearsal, it. he'd sing it or I'd sing it, and we'd just go, oh, yeah, you sing it. You know, yeah. we just decide in one, after one sing, you know. Were there a lot of songs that got lost from the early years, and did you ever play any cover tunes live? We played, we played a, a couple, of co couple cover tunes early in the on. beginning. We did, we, we did it again by the Soft Machine. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of. Uh, we did it. Of you really got me, yeah. Kings. And um, uh, don't worry, baby. And love is the drug. Oh, yeah. I'm on Give fire. Me, I forgot about that one. Dwight Twilly. Give me some kind of sign. Give me some like kind Brent of sign. Wood, like a Roxy Music yeah. version of it. Yeah. What else? Um, I'm waiting for the man. I think we might have played a few times. Uh, there were there were a couple of songs. I mean, for the most part, our songs, I would try to stay to the nice concise solos, and you know, just would always feel like they were part 
you know, like little compositions within within the songs, and um, so I wouldn't stray too far. But there were a couple of songs like "Dangerous Type" and "Your Life Got Tonight" and "Take What You Want," where there were some open areas where I could cue the band back in, and and we, you know, go back into the song proper. And so there were some little, you know, some some spots in the live show where we could stretch it out a little bit. Greg played. You played guitar on, oh, on that's that right. one, right? That's right. That's Are you playing saxophone on the, this performance at all? I can't remember. No? Or what, on the music line? Yeah. Is there any saxophone? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, that's too bad. Mixed up. I can't remember. I, Did you used to whip out the saxophone? I can, from time to time. But I don't, I don't know. And, and you got to do your multiple percussion uh, showcase on I'm in Touch, on with, I'm your in world. touch with Your World. That was always <laughs> one of my favorite ones the ratchet to play live. Virus <laughs> Rap. Yes. Looks like a, a lot of coordination. I had to go like reaching, pulling out all these different things and just getting the right cue. Yeah. Plus, I figured it'd be fun, to, fun for people to watch visually. Uh oh, is he gonna make it? Oh. <laughs> Oops, he didn't make it. <laughs> so are there a lot of other lost songs like that 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 you would play that never made it to the records for whatever reason? I don't know about a lot, but there's there's some there's probably some. It's sometimes you forget. Some of them are on the Rhino anthology. A lot of stuff uh, that we recorded in demo forms, or, or may have started for the record. And there were some on the uh, on the deluxe version of the first album, and uh, and a handful of things that were recorded that have yet to be released. I think we did have some of the songs already because we were, when we played live we played some new songs. So I bet you there was probably at least half of the songs on Candio that were already done. And then because of, you know, just the energy of the band, it was kind of easy to write a lot more, you know, for just having the energy, you know, during the spirit and everything from those times, you know, you just, it actually, it's, it doesn't take, you know, a particularly long time to write songs. It just takes uh, a particular time to do it, like it's, if you're in the mood. I think, you know, uh, usually it just takes, you know, maybe, uh, a month or two to write, you know, 25 songs. If you're in the spirit of doing it, you can just keep writing, you know. It's just being in the spirit. And I, I think after the tour and everything, uh, for the first record, I just think everybody was kind of dying to do new stuff. And I was kind of really ready to die and to write too, because you sort of kept away from it, you know, when you're touring and stuff. So it was motivating to do it. You know, we didn't have time to think about like following it up or living up to the next. You know, I think we were just swept up and going forward. You know, <clears throat> and we also, in in a in a way, I don't really think we. Uh, you know, as I mean, I think uh, maybe we were one of them too. But you know, some bands, I we we like to have singles, and we were surprised that we had them. But but we weren't actually. Uh, I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes people get embarrassed by their singles, you know. And uh, maybe at the, as a new band, I know for me it was like a shock to have a single, and I thought, well, geez, you know, I, I don't know if I ever wanted a single, but and then we got singles, and, you know, the, you just keep writing, but you don't, you don't write like, you don't try to write a single or anything. It's a good way to get real tired of a song that you used to love. Yeah, I totally. Oh, single. yeah. Then, because it's familiar to you as well. Like when you're playing songs live, and the singles come up that you're going to play, it feels funny because you feel you feel like you're playing a cover. Yeah, <laughs> this is that song that we play. Yeah, yeah. this is a cover song. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny. The first album cover was designed by the record company. We had a, no input, I would say, into that, right? Our, no, cover, no, no. our cover was actually the we inside did. sleeve. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> the sleeve I that David did, that was it. But yeah. it had like some bondage stuff on it and some yeah, like, crazy stuff, so they didn't want to do that. They didn't like it. Uh, uh, also, we were a new group. So and they, they didn't even tell us. They, they didn't want to give it. us. It just sort of came out. Yeah, they didn't want to really give us a break because we were a, a, new, a new group. Uh, but me and Jerome Higgins had designed uh, a very different album cover that cost $80 to design. I remember the price exactly. It was completely finished and everything, but it was a little more bizarre than the, than the cover that they had in mind. So they changed some of it because of copyright problems and put it in as the inner sleeve. 
But I think that was way more how we envisioned oh, who I'm we were right. back then. There was stuff from the day the Earth stood still. Yeah, there was stuff we couldn't right. we couldn't get clearance on. Klaatu, Michael Rennie. Yeah, right? and we quickly like rephotographed some of the stuff and put it in there. I, you know, I thought that when the electric cover came out, it was like too way too slick. The pictures of us, I didn't like, and it, I don't know how, big, how everybody maw felt of about it. Mouth. But and, and, yeah, well, you know, we ha we would do these appearances at record stores where we'd sign autographs and get behind a table and people would buy the record and file by and man I got tired of that cover. Which one? The first album, that big grinning face. Just, what about the sperm colored uh, steering wheel? Yeah, that, that I didn't get tired of. That I, kinda, I like the steering I wheel. Like that too. But that big red lipstick mouth, I, mean, I remember like blacking out teeth in it and just... Like, <laughs> but you know what? The cover did really well, didn't it? Didn't it, what, didn't it get an award or something? That cover? The first album cover. I don't know. I think I heard something <laughs> about that. It, it was, was like, like actually, well, everybody liked it. Kids, well, people liked it, definitely. People liked yeah. it. But Didn't you think it was kind of slick, though? Oh, yeah. For it was what weird. we thought we were then? You know what it was? Their promotion departments at the big labels weren't really ready for a band like us, and they didn't, we didn't fit into any of their compartments. We weren't Jackson Brown, and we weren't, you know, a lot of the other Electro Asylum artists. We weren't Joni Mitchell or whoever. We, you know, we had our own thing, and we were East Coast, and distinctively East Coast, I'd say, compared to a lot of the, the acts. And I don't think they really, they, they just did the best they could trying to understand where we were coming from. But that was they, definitely a West Coast cover, too, I think, Yeah, in my mind. you know, and it was just... <clears throat> they actually even used the exact same technique for the photograph on the back for another one of their groups a few months later. Yeah. Called Creed. The exact same Creed. photograph, almost. Not oh, the Creed that's the out now. the telephone pole thing? Yes, exactly the same, same thing. Also, this was at a time when lots of groups did, like, do-it-yourself album covers and stuff. Punk bands everywhere did all their own stuff, but none of them were on major labels or anything. But they did start a trend of having a woman on the cover of our records, which carried through to quite a few of them. Uh, I don't think we ever thought we were any kind of punk band. I think it was New Wave is what they started to call it. Yeah. I mean, we didn't... No, uh, definitely not punk. No. No. <laughs> we used we to think punk, the word was silly, kind of, because it was like punks. Punk was like the Sex Pistols and Susie and the Banshees or something. Yeah. That's what we thought, anyway. Wow. We were caught up in the energy of it. You know, in the sense that we played some of the same clubs that so-called punk bands played. We we played the Rat Rat Skeller in Boston. We played we played CBGBs once, but uh, I personally always took pride in 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 the fact that we didn't get lumped in with all those bands. It's like whenever they talk about that era, they'll say you know, you know they'll, they'll, they say the Ramones, Mink Deville, Blondie, Talking Heads, you know, whatever. And I'm glad that we're not like part of some, some easy to define category. It's like when you say San Francisco Rock and you go Janis Joplin, The Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane. But we never were. I don't think we uh, fell easily into um, a journalistic category that was just easy to define. I mean, you, you, they called anything that came out that year new wave. You know, I mean, I don't know what that meant or anything. We'd all been playing music a long time and just playing the way we play. Excellent. We just wanted to keep making music. We didn't, there was no plan. We, I remember it being in England making the first record and some of us having the conversation just got to hope this thing sells enough so that we, we can make another one because this was fun. You know, we liked doing it and if it had sold a hundred thousand or something or however many we would have needed to recoup enough to do it again would have been enough, I think, for most of us. That's all. We were just looking to yeah, make I th records. I, I think we kind of figured it would it would at least do well around Boston because yeah. we had already been getting the airplay. Anything else was like a happy surprise. And some people thought we were an English band, didn't they? Yeah, a lot of people thought we were an English band. Still do. Yeah, <laughs> totally. People come up to me now and say, well, you're from England, right? <laughs> I go, yeah. yeah New England. <laughs> yeah, New England. <laughs> So on the records, there were a lot of sounds, and I see on the tape you got them all, pretty much got them all on stage. Um, how challenging was that? Did you have to use a lot of gadgetry? Or uh, for the first record, it was pretty much, I mean, it was pretty easy. It was, you know, I'm in touch, you know, had to, had to grab this and grab that. But uh, it really, it wasn't really that hard to do, like, all the keyboard parts until, like, Heartbeat City. 
were like there was like sort of so layered it just not enough hands and started using sequencers and stuff a lot but we'd also I mean like we layered a lot of background vocals and things I think in the studio that might have been technologically difficult to reproduce at that time yeah. uh, that was always a little point with us um, Chris Chris uh, our first producer Roy Thomas Baker who had done you know Bohemian Rhapsody and these grandiose records and he was really into big vocals and and we were turned on to it you know we liked the sound of it it sounded great and you heard all those voices played back but there's no way you know four or five guys can you know reproduce that on we on can't sing 72 tracks of vocals no yeah. and and there was no such yeah. thing as samplers we weren't into like flying stuff artificially yeah, in yeah. so yeah. we never had tapes or anything on stage so I just, just remember when we did good times roll in the studio in England the first record and uh, when we heard back the vocals, I, I told Roy that I thought it was way, way too much. <laughs> I said, well, Roy, that's like way too much. I, that just sounds like so many. But, you know, it grew on me later, and it sounded so smooth. It was a nice process to do it because Roy, you know, was fortunate enough to have like a 40-track machine, which in the day of 24-track, he had his own special machine. So he could do layering of vocals a lot. We spent probably more time layering vocals on the first album than anything else. Oh, yeah. Because it only took 12 days to make. And I think mo half the time was probably just layering the vocals. I did all my guitar parts in a day and a half. Yeah. I remember that And we just did the basics, you know, like, because we were pretty, pretty just really Ill. good from live. But that shocked me, those big voices. Four guys singing one part, you double it, like, four times. Mm -hmm. So that's, like, the equivalent of about 16 voices, just like on the first harmony. Then you do the same thing with the second and third. So you got like a whole gang, gang of guys yeah. singing in there. Some of the effects that are on the first album are really long drum effects. They sound like keyboards. There's, there's a lot of them that people have always thought were keyboards. But uh, you could get this like three minute delay on, on all these really weird mostly sort of outer space kind of sounds. You can hear them at the ends and beginnings of songs and stuff. Uh, so you had to program those, that sound, if you could find it again, into, the, into the, the drum machine. And then if anybody bumped the equipment or like turned a knob, you'd go to hit a sound that was supposed to last like three minutes and it would end in about five seconds. You'd have to try to like figure out wh no, where it went. Yeah, like where it went. It was just like knobs everywhere and foot switches everywhere. Back in the good old days. Yes. <laughs> and it was steam powered. <laughs> Remember in Live Aid, they were all triggered involuntarily. We were playing in front of two billion people, and, and out in the hot sun, those you know electronic drums started, and, and Ben singing, "Who's going to drive you home?" And I hear, "Beetle, little, 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 doom, doom, and all this stuff just going off, man, uh, going out live and satellite." Do you remember that? <laughs> but we always loved all the latest electronic stuff and tried to go out and find whatever we, we could use. Yeah, we liked the technology. For drummers, they didn't have a lot of stuff for a long, for a long time. But usually we would send out our, our tech guy and he would just come back with a bunch of stuff he thought I might like and would plug all kinds of things in and see what they did. We even got to uh, get some things from Roland when we were in Japan that weren't out for America yet. We brought some of the first TR-808 drum machines back. I remember everybody bought one. And Did we that? get those in Japan? Well, we ordered them at least. You know, yeah. we, we saw them for the first time oh. Oh. in Japan. There was a Roland representative. Yep, I the TR-808 TR is not like the workhorse of... We got to see you know, of, the future of, of uh, yeah. you know, what the next year of music uh, yeah. technology was coming. And so we, we, some of that stuff uh, we, we got early on. Greg got the, the Prophet synthesizer very early on, right? And, and, uh, Synthesized bass. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, you had pedals too. Yeah. What happened to those pedals? I forgot about those pedals. The sub super subsonic pedals you had. Mechon Octavider. Yeah. Ah, oh yeah. Octavider. Had to have it. We so, used that and all mixed up. It's gotten miniaturized, but then you needed one box just to do slapback echo. Where now you got a little thing this big that'll do eight simultaneous effects and be controlled by your feet. Then uh, you know we had big racks of stuff. You'd have to, you'd have to drag along whatever made the sound in the studio. Basically, that created it wasn't. There weren't a lot of little pedals that did that stuff then. It was just coming on. You know, I've got that chorus pedal, and that was, that was a big part of my sound in the early 
stuff, the rolling chorus. I was just thinking how when, when Captain Swing played Max's Kansas City for all the big management companies and one of the comments that we got were that we didn't look unified. You know, one guy looked like he should be in The Grateful Dead and one guy looked like he should be in The Velvet Underground and one guy looked like this or that. And I think, you know, that was one of the criticisms is that we were too musically and image-wise all over the map, right? Yeah. And uh, I think we took some of that to heart, and I think that also had an influence on our making an attempt to uh, to try to develop some kind of some kind of unified image to put forward. It's, I think it's always kind of a little weird to see someone else's perception of you, because you probably you know you see yourself so differently, and to and to like make a record and just like put it out there and it goes from this personal thing to something that like anybody can comment on or take home and listen to and have an opinion on and sometimes it's a little hard to relate to because you just make you know you're just working on stuff and making making music art whatever and uh, it's tough to it, it, it sometimes feels funny to see how you're viewed by other people Ben did you think of yourself as the sexy one I oh, hell no <laughs> Randy, maybe, but uh, not the sexy one. The amazing Randy. <laughs> Sven Harlander. That's there you go. <laughs> no, I, no. I've always kept my one foot on the ground. It's just a show. Act. And then you leave the stage and you're somebody else. But nobody else sees that except these guys and the crew. And that was terrifying. I think we liked being separated from the from the, the music business. It's kind of cool yeah, to be separated system. from the music business, you Hi. know, be up there. And we kind of got our own thing going up there, you know, once we got, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the studio going and, you know, we had sort of our clubhouse in our studio and, <laughs> and uh, we hung there all the time and, you know, uh, we just liked it. And we also thought it was probably one of the best music scenes in the yeah. country. Radio was still it. supportive and you know, yeah, you know, all the musicians you know, were happy about the scene that was going on, but it actually garnered uh, enough attention so that there'd be articles in like Newsweek or something about it being like a hot spot, and there was a lot of people looking at Boston at that time for maybe a three-year period, signing group, coming to town, signing all the groups it's like up and stuff. like what happened in stuff. Seattle a few years ago. It was almost that kind yeah. of thing, right? Like Boston was a hot town for a minute. And of course, it had a tradition uh, before that of being a good place for musicians to come to anyway. It with folk, folk scene and jazz yeah. scene and stuff. Student population that would yep. support new music and always looking for <clears throat> new music. And we were able to at least eke out a modest living playing in this band even before we ever got a record deal. I mean, it was only, you know, a couple hundred dollars a month maybe, but we were able to exist playing our own songs, which was probably unheard of in a lot of places in the country. You could never, you'd have to be playing just top 40 just to just to exist. And so Boston was good that way. Plus when bands came through town, they would always find their way to that studio to visit some of them. It was a good place, like we brought Iggy Pop back after his show. It was a good place to come back after like someone's show at the Paradise or something and we'd go back and listen to tapes or hang out and have a little party or whatever. And, and it, was a, it was a good way to host uh, musicians that we liked. And we had a place that we could invite them to and hang out with them. And, also, it was the first, I think, the first recording studio I had ever set foot in years before with the Modern Lovers. We bought a studio and then we just like gave it all away to people. And, you know, we made it our it clubhouse. Never, it, never was a it was basically a clubhouse that we just financed. <clears throat> we tried to have people manage it, but I think we thought that bands would kind of like coming up to Boston instead of New York or LA just for a break and just yeah. for a place where they wouldn't be under the microscope so much. And, and uh, we had hoped that you know more major national acts would come and make records there, but I think that's down to management, probably, or just the way the place was managed. But uh, it was fun, fun having our own studio. Yeah, it was fun working on it too. We worked with the designers and everything, gutted the building and put all John beautiful Storick. interiors in it. And it was really nice. We didn't want to do anything fake, you know. Like we didn't want to come out and say the same thing every night or have like. You know, the show opens with, uh, 
you know, Craig saying a piece, and then we yeah, go into yeah. this song, and then yeah, Ben moves from here course. to here, and we do this. We never wanted to do that because it didn't feel like right. We felt it was yeah, sort of show busy. Was, yeah, we didn't want to be show business. Where they make you clap, and you know, it was just totally obvious and stuff. We even took it a step further. We we, we hosted the midnight special, and we had absolutely no talking whatsoever. Even in introducing the bands, it's the only midnight special that you'll ever see that doesn't have Wolfman Jack going, oh, you know, I mean, it was just like, like a computer printout at the bottom of the screen saying, and now here's a band you'll enjoy, M, singing pop music or whatever, you know, it was, or Robert Fripp, or, and, uh, and the entire night there wasn't one word said. I mean, I think that, that was one of the... Uh, ultimate versions of that. You remember how it came about? We actually didn't want to do it because we didn't like the show and think too much of the show. We thought it was so corny. So we thought we would make demands that they could never See how us. much you could get away so with. So we said, yeah, if we can have anybody we want on and we don't have on the actual host of the show, we'll do it. And they said, oh, yeah, that, yeah, we'll do that. So we were stuck doing, doing the show. So we thought, well, let's make the best of it. So we... Yeah, so we, so we had Iggy and we had like all these bands Lena, we'd like. Lena Lovich. Yeah. Suicide in front of Suicide. millions and millions of American viewers. <laughs> the records <laughs> were on live with us. Yeah. And, and Wolfman was nowhere in sight, you know, because we'd always seen that show and like they'd always break for commercial with him with his arm around like the singer and they'd make the wolf call and we'll be right back. And there was no way this band was going to do that stuff. So <laughs> we just devised a way to make it work for us and it was just this like you know, there's a new, there's a new scene in music and, you know, tonight's an evening of something you might not have seen before and it was kind of cool, you know. It was and I think everybody liked it. I think the, the for producers mainstream of the TV, show it was a pretty cool liked thing. it and everything, but they just went right back to the regular format. Oh yeah, the next week was back to Didn't even mention Casey and the Sunshine Band or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but it was done naively, you know, we just didn't, uh, none of us were like, you know, doing acrobats, and none of us like had that kind of fake show presence. No. Yeah, and also we never said we're not going to talk either. No, no we didn't. It just felt like that's what we. But should we got be a doing. rep as that. We, you know, we never said, "All right, New York." You know, we never did that stuff. You know, it just never felt like it went with the music, really. But we got complaints and stuff from critics that we oh, didn't yeah, do all it the time. all the time. Always. We just figured they, they said understand. we were we were no, cold and and didn't like welcome the people like we should. Right, like we didn't give them the sh you know because it, what we didn't do that Pavlovian thing you know that they all yeah, go to yeah. a show to expect you know it was a li it, we asked a little more of the audience per perhaps. We didn't have any mob psychology going on. It was just you know music. I basically live a lot at night because I'm I I happen to be one of those nocturnal. You know, people who stay up all night, you know, go to bed at four and wake up at twelve. You know, and uh, I just think there's mystery in in the night, and lots of lots of different kinds of thinking goes on at night, and it's just a more mysterious time. And people, you know, I, I guess so. Night crawls into the songs, you know, um, because it's a because maybe I don't like day that much and uh, but you know I, I never I can't really I think of a song that I actually based on a particular person anyway uh, you know most songs like I might have said oh, once before uh, they're sort of like uh, they can be autobiographical but they're also fiction you know but say sort of like Take, you were talking about the book the other day by Michael Crichton, you know, how he mm -hmm. takes like scientific facts, but he makes it into a, sci a science fiction novel. So maybe I take some like, you know, specific situations and then turn them into a fictitious thing. Well, the women would have to be made up because I certainly didn't, you know, carouse like, you know, I didn't have women hanging off my arm all the time, you know. But, uh, you know, I, I, maybe it's just, uh, uh, they're, they're kind of maybe they were maybe they were fantasy things you know maybe they were uh, you know they they weren't based on real personal experiences on a nightly basis you know but but maybe they were just uh, things I thought people would think or wondered how people got themselves in a particular situation and and uh, and uh, I also thought a lot of them were uh, comic. 
you can have a healthy libido without actually acting out. Yeah. <laughs> I thought they were kind of similar. I mean, I wouldn't say a song like Drive was comic, but you know, I, but some of them had, to me they were comic. <laughs> Well, that's, you know, that's the other thing, though. We had sort of our own humor in the band that maybe, like, we weren't perceived as, as, as a funny band particularly, but, but, but we laughed a lot and, and had a lot of jokes. And I think there's probably things in, in the songs that, that we know, like, I'm on top of my nerves or little lines. Yeah, right. that, you know, we know where they come from, but uh, nobody else would, you know. And, and so uh, it's probably just like any band, you know, develops a lexicon, you know, of their own. Well, we had a good one going. Oh, yeah. You know, it was a very funny band, believe it or not. <laughs> it's, it's funny. It, when people come up to you and it affects so many people, then I have to kind of say, well, you know, if you like it, I'm not going to destroy your dream. But, you know, but, but, you know, it's like, I mean, I guess as an artist, you got to, you know, think about like, uh, well, I don't know if you have to think about it, but basically, you, you know, you're kind of laying something out and it's kind of it feels a little vulnerable, you know. You're pretty vulnerable, really, because your lyrics are kind of what you think, you know. I mean, I think I also hide in them, you know. I think there's some stuff hidden. I think you hide behind them a little bit. I mean, maybe sometimes, you know, twisting the stuff around is it's like a puzzle that I can understand, you know. It's like a thing that, and I think the band, too, you know, kind of like, uh, they understand like the, the twisted words or, or maybe they understand something about the, the mood of it, you know, but and sometimes, you know, you can, you know, you can say what you want, but you can also like kind of, uh, you know, twist it a little bit so that it can have other meanings and, you know, and that's what I would like to do, you know. I like to leave it kind of open for interpretation. That's why sometimes in interviews people want to know the exact meaning of something. And I, I think, well, it's, there's no real exact meaning, you know. Uh, it's kind of a good, you know, you can interpret a meaning that you're welcome to keep and have, and I'll agree with you. <laughs> a candio, I, I, it's funny, I never knew anyone candio. Did I? I don't think so. You never it's, told me about it. I, yeah. It's like, you know, something you say that's kind of like feels good to say, like when you're rocking along or something and, and you just something just comes out of your mouth you know? Scans good it shit. sounds like you know hey that's feels like okay that's kind of cool you know if, as long as you don't censor yourself too much you know you can come up with things like candy <laughs> I, I think the thing I'm proudest of is that we're a band that you hear a few seconds of it and you know what band it is that we were actually a band that mattered a little bit to people and and made some kind of contribution that added and just moved the thing along a little bit and you know I'm very proud of that I'm proud of the music we made I'm proud of these guys just the music itself you know has the fact that it's like lasted this long and uh when you occasionally, you know, you get the occasional person who comes up to you and says, oh yeah, you know, I, I used to love the cars, you know, it, you know, people in other bands, sometimes that's neat, it, you know, when you hear like younger bands say, oh, I, re you know, used to listen to the cars and they influenced me and stuff. That's pretty cool. Well, I like the fact that we were a, a good pop band. I thought we had, uh, you know, some integrity about it. Um, I think we cared about like the, you know, commercial side and the art side. We tried to make it interesting, you know, both ways. And uh, I think while we were, you know, when we were in the cars, uh, we were pretty focused on like uh, what we thought was good music, you know, besides uh, our own. Uh, and we would try to, you know, uh, lift that up a little bit too, you know, we'd go to radio stations and play you know, other people's records that we liked and that we thought were like new on the scene. And we tried to promote like, uh, you know, kind of music and art together, you know. And, uh, you know, we, we were a band that uh, I thought like also, uh, you know, for years and years, you know, loved each other and had a good time. And, uh, 
you know, so it was a proud of the, it was a positive experience, you know. Enjoying the music that we played and still having it recognized by the kids of, uh, you know, the kids that, the kids of the kids that used to be at the concerts. Um, good camaraderie. Glad we're all friends and lived through all that for about 10 years of peace. Mm -hmm. It's been great fun. Proud to do that. They're great people. About it. For me, the test is to put on the CDs now and listen to them, and they sound better to me than usually than they ever did. And I'm amazed at how good everybody separately ha has impressed me when I listen to them now. You know, I love, I always think of us as a band, but now it's easier to listen to Elliot's guitar playing separately like I'd never heard it. And they're all just incredible. You know, they're amazing. <laughs>